This is a good season to refocus, isn't it? This is a good season to refocus, isn't it? Um, can I tell you something, guys? This is has been, and I think all of us are in the same boat here, but this has been one of the toughest seasons. And I th- for sure, the toughest season that we've faced uh, around the world as a global community in this generation. Um, probably the, uh, the Spanish flu uh, that happened in conjunction with World War I uh, was probably the last time that we had seen anything on this scale. Um, but this has certainly been even a more long lasting experience than what happened during that epidemic. And um, it has created a lot of, of, of angst and anxiety and frustration and challenge and heartache and loss, right? It's been a tough season. And it's easy when you're in a season like that to lose focus. Because you start to kind of chase the squirrels of life, right? Just whatever runs around. Um, when, when I was growing up, there was no such thing as ADD but I check all the boxes for adult ADD. Um, I tell people that I don't have ADD, I have ADOL, which, which stands for attention deficit. Oh, look, right? Because it's, it's always something, it gets us distracted, right? Um, but, you know, we're, we're talking about um, ADD, and uh, that really stands for attention. Why wow, I like that shirt. It's really nice. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. It stands, it stands for attention. Did I ever tell you guys this story when I was growing up and, and I had issues with staying focused on things? Um, when, when I was growing up, they didn't have a label for it because my mom had a belt. So, you know, it kind of, it, it kind of took care of that. And, um, and so, this sermon's off to a horrible start. Thank you guys for hanging out with me, though, because my parents had a cure for ADD, right? And of course, you know, ADD stands for Attention Deficit Disorder. And um, it's, it's just kind of interesting to me to think about how much distraction we're faced with in this era, right? Literally, the jump in technology over the last 20 years has been mind-blowing absolutely i was i was out of college before i used the internet for the first time now i like i use the internet for literally everything right somebody asked me um hey what is your most valued bible study tool i said google right and you all are in the same boat, right? You, you, like, if you want to know something about the Bible, what do you do? You Google it, right? And um, it, it's interesting. You want to know something about your medical condition. What do you do? Unwisely Google it, right? And the problem is every time you have a headache or a toe fungus, it's always cancer, right? And you're terrified the moment you look it up. So stop, like, you know, don't, don't do that. But there's, now we're in an era, I remember when, when I was growing up, television stopped airing things at midnight. And there were some channels that it would just go to static. And then there were some channels that before it went to static, they would put the American flag up, waving, right? And they would do like the Star Spangled Banner. And then pfft, it would go to static. And, and, and so... Now, though, when, when I was a, I, I don't know exactly when it happened, but there, when the cable, cable TV hit, right? And um, it was a luxury then, because everybody had like three channels. And if you had your kid hold the antenna, you got five channels, right? And so I was always the antenna holder and the remote um, in my family. Up until the time I was 13 years old, we only had a little 13 inch black and white TV that if I held the aluminum foil that was attached to the rabbit ears, we could get five channels and it was great. And that's how we watched 
uh, baseball, you know, I would hold the antenna and we would watch. And, um, and my dad would turn on the radio and we would set the radio by the baseball game on TV. It was fun. Now we have a 24 hour news cycle. Like just the news channels and we got CNN and NBC and MSNBC and HIJK Element OP and Fox News and right, we've got all of these news stations that are constantly pumping out information. And then if that's not enough to get it on TV, you could put the app on your phone and they'll remind you every 16 seconds of everything that's wrong in the world, right? You'll get a notification. And then if you have a ring doorbell, they will notify you every five seconds if somebody heard a car backfire in your neighborhood, right? And then, then you get emails and heaven help us if you like go on a website and you sign up for like to buy a product or whatever and then they put you on their email list and you get 470 emails a week from a company that you don't even like, right? And that's, it's like annoying. And then you get text messages and you get text messages um, constantly and then you get Facebook notifications, right? And then not only if Facebook is not enough torture for you, you can actually get Instagram too. And Instagram will torment you with constant notifications about what's going on in other people's lives and give you the opportunity to see the best of them. And then you, you have, um, you have your, you know, your phone is also, like this has a thousand times more computing power than my first PC did. Like ridiculous amounts of, and so we've got video games on our phones too, right? And so like, how many of you remember before you had a phone and you went to the bathroom and you could read the shampoo bottle, you know? But now it's just like constantly vying for your attention and there's constant distraction. And so I think we're in a season of life before the pandemic where we needed to just refocus. I've, I've talked to Mary several times. If I could get a flip phone that had a full keyboard that just did texting and, and phone calls, I think I would probably go back because I get tired of the constant notifications. I wanna stay focused. I wanna be focused. And in this season, I think it's important to refocus on what's most important and what's most important now and what's most important from the beginning has always been Jesus. And, and it seems so intuitive, it's kind of like, commence eye rolls, okay, we're gonna talk about focusing on Jesus. I got it, pastor. We're supposed to focus, you're supposed to say that because you're the pastor, we get it, but we have jobs, okay? So we can't always, you know, we're not gonna join a monastery and just, that's not what I'm saying. That's not what this series is about. And as a matter of fact, until I get free from the Holy Spirit on this topic of just talking about Jesus, he's all I'm gonna be talking about for the next however long. Because he's the only thing that matters. And he shapes and changes and shifts and aligns everything in our life. In the next several weeks, I'm gonna be even showing you Jesus in the Old Testament. Do you know that Jesus is all over the Old Testament too? He's everywhere. Why? Because he's the point. One of the challenges that we face in this life is that most Christians, especially Western Christians, think that we're supposed to live like Jesus, right? You're like, Pastor, is this a trick question? I think, yeah, yeah, we're supposed to live like Jesus, right? And, and, and the reality is, yeah, we're supposed to live like Jesus, but we don't live like Jesus the way you think we live like Jesus, right? I wish that everybody in my life was more like Jesus, don't you? I, I wish that the guy at the MVA was more like Jesus, right? I, I wish the customer service at the post office took some cues from Jesus. I wish, I wish that my kids would learn to serve like Jesus, right? I wish that people around me that I've offended would learn to forgive 
like Jesus, don't you? It sounded like I was throwing my kids under the bus. I'm not. Sorry. But the bottom line for today is that the character of Christ is not something that you can manufacture. You can't produce the character of Christ in your life. On your best day, you cannot produce the character of Christ in your life. The best you can offer when you do it in your strength is a cheap imitation of Jesus. And who likes imitation anything? You remember when imitation hardwood floors first came out? They didn't fool anybody. We're like, somebody got their inkjet printer and printed on some paper and then waterproofed it and stuck it in the floor of their house, right? That's why I remember when it first came out and I got some in my living, and I bought it at Sam's Club because it was the cheapest, right? And it looked like it was the cheapest. And it didn't take long before it started peeling and everything, and I was like, this is not like real hardwood. They lied to me. This is not water resistant, right? Who here, like, imitation crab meat is your jam. You're like, man, I... I know, I would really love to go get some real Maryland blue crabs, but honestly, the imitation crab meat, it's better, you know? I just, that's what I want. I, I, I like that. No, none of us feel that way. See, the reality of the character of Christ is that it's produced by Christ. It's not produced by you. And so the best thing that you have to offer is that you can be a vessel that is open to allowing the life and character of Christ to flow through you. That's how it works. And so we're going to look at a passage. This is actually my life verse is found in this passage, and it's John chapter 15. We're, going to, we're actually going to start at verse 5, then we're going to back up and roll through some other scriptures. But this is the one that's... That's my life verse. And it says, yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. And so when we read a passage of Scripture like this, we say, what am I supposed to do? To which Jesus would say, just remain. Yeah, I know, but like... What am I supposed to do, though? And Jesus says, remain, abide, stick close. We say, yeah, right. So that means, like, stop cussing and stop smoking and, 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 and stop listening to rock and roll. And, oh, and then I got to go to church, right? And, and I'm spo- I need to download the Bible app, and right? We, we start to take a verse like this, and we make a, a religious checklist, so that we can start checking off the boxes that mean we are remaining. It's not how it works. And can I tell you something? This is so confusing to most people, right? Because we feel like we need a checklist. Just tell me what to do. I want to please you, just tell me what to do. I remember when I first got married, and, and, I was not awesome at being married when I got married. Apparently, apparently, you're not supposed to just throw your towel and underwear on the ground after you're done with the shower and leave it there. I remember when, I remember when Mary, for the first time, she probably doesn't remember this, but I remember this. <laughs> I walked in the bathroom, and she goes, what is that? I was like, towel and underwear. She was like, what's it doing there? And that was when I caught on. I was like, oh, she doesn't re- She knew it was a towel and underwear. She was just messing with And she doesn't really want to know what it's doing. She knows it's just like what she's trying to do in a very sweet way is say, 
pick your dang towel and drawers up, right? And, and, and I've gotten better at that. It took me 26 years, but I now, every time, pick up my shorts and towel after a shower and put them in their proper place. And there's still a whole bunch of things that I don't do, right? And over the years, I've said to Mary, could you just tell me what you, what you want me to do? Like, I really, no, I just want to know. And I want to honor you. I want to make you, ha- I want this, right? I, that's why I got married. And so, but the point of relationship isn't that somebody gives you a checklist of what's going to make them happy. The point of relationship is that you say, I love you. I want to honor you. How can I demonstrate my love for you? I don't want to create a hardship for you that you would have to pick my junk up when I'm perfectly capable of picking my junk up. I can rinse a bowl. I can rinse both kinds of bowls. I can rinse the bowl in the sink. I can rinse the bowl in the bathroom. Guys, it's just a little lever. You just, you push down on it, everything goes away. It's really cool. (laughs) there are so many ways I can go with this and I'm just not even going to go those ways I'm just going to say I'm just for illustration point because this is so difficult to get sometimes because in relationship with God we're still trying to do the same things we're just like God just give me a checklist what and God's like that's not what relationship looks like yes there is a law yes there is what we've demonstrated through the centuries is that law keeping is not relationship building. So I've invited you to remain in me. And here's the cool thing. If you remain in me, I will remain in you. This is so cool. This is what the gospel is all about, right? Because so many people are trying to make checklists, but then there's another group of people that don't want any checklist at all. They're like, well, I'm just abiding in God, so I can do whatever I want to do, right? Because I know that God's got me. Jesus is my homeboy. I got a T-shirt and a trucker hat that says that. Can I tell you something? Before Jesus was ever your homeboy, he was your savior. Yes, in this very chapter that we're reading, Jesus says, I have called you friends. Thank God, right? Thank God that he calls us friends. But can I tell you something? Both of those things, this this careless disregard for things that honor God, and the religious attention to detail that says, I can never, and I can never, and I must always in it, both of those extremes focus on one thing, and that is your performance. And that is not the point. The point is to remain in me. Remain in me. Remain in me. And so, when we read the Old Testament, we read this vine language repeatedly. But every time we read about the vine in the Old Testament, do you know what it's in reference to? It's in reference to the wrath of God. And and Israel is always compared to a vine. And, And what God says about Israel as a vine is, you're a vine that's not bearing fruit, and so you'll be cut off. And so... This vine language is critical to understanding this passage because when we read this, Jesus now is using vine language and talking about himself and says, hey, look, Israel, you've blown it every time. But I am the true vine. I'm the vine. 
and I have done what you could never do. I consistently, constantly, always, only bear good fruit. And so when, when Jesus does that, then the connection is, now I'm bringing you in. I'm attaching you to myself. And when I do that, guess what? You're going to bear fruit. And as we read through the New Testament, we read about how the Gentiles, that's us, we're grafted in. We're grafted in. And it's such a beautiful picture. And so as, as Jesus is this fruit-bearing vine, it's so simple to see the metaphor come alive, isn't it? Because vines produce fruit. If you, if you go to an orchard, right? My uncle, when I was growing up, he owned a thousand acre apple and peach orchard. And we used to ride motorcycles and, and he had an old 1970 Bronco with a three on the tree. And that's one of the places I would get out and I would stretch it out. We'd go through the big hills and stuff and ride around in the orchard. And, and we would, uh, we, we had a blast. And, um, I remember how cool it was when you would start to see the fruit coming on the trees. And, and you would ride through there. You know what I never once saw any time that I went through the orchard? I never saw a single branch on a single fruit tree going, come on, bear fruit, bear fruit, bear fruit, bear fruit, bear fruit. They just bore fruit. There was no effort to it. It was just fruit. They stayed connected to the trunk, and because it stayed connected to the trunk, the source of life, the outflow of everything good, it just bore fruit. Right? When when I think about what it means to bear fruit, it's so powerful. I remember when Mary and I, when I was getting ready to ask her to marry me, and I bought her engagement ring, and I saved for months and months and months to be able to buy an engagement ring. I remember the day that I went to pick it up, I bought it from a guy at church, and it was kind of funny because it it almost, when I went to pick it up, it looked like we were selling illegal guns or something out of the trunk of his car, right? So he rolls up in this parking lot, and he pops his trunk. I'm like, Dude, it's this big. Why do you need to pop your trunk? What are, we, what are we doing here? And I got this cash in my pocket, and I remember going to buy it. You know, it was like the most money I'd ever spent on a single purchase. And, and I walk up, and I'm like, hey, man, you got it? And I'm like, wait, this is so bad. And so, so I give him the money, and he, like, counts it out on his hood, and then he opens the trunk, right, and he pulls out the ring, and he's like, this is it. And he gives me the little jeweler's loop, like, I know what I'm looking at, right? I'm like, yeah, oh, yeah, that's, uh, that's real. I don't know what I'm looking at, right? And so, um, so, but I remember, though, leaving with it in my pocket, and everywhere, like, Every three seconds, I would stick my hand in my pocket to make sure it was still there. And then I would pull up to a stoplight, and I would open it up and just make sure that the ring hadn't somehow slipped out of the little box thing, right? I'm like, it's in my pocket. It's not going to fall out, right? So I, but I keep it in there. But there was such an aware, I was like, and then I get to where I'm going, and, and I'm like, oh, shoot. And then I had to put it in another pocket because of the way that I set up the proposal. And so I have to move it in the pocket. And then I'm like, is it in that pocket? You know, and then I'm freaked out. And then I reach down and it's not in this pocket. It's in this pocket. But I thought it was still in this pocket. And I was like, whoa. And I'm freaking out, right? Where's, oh, it's in here. It's in here. And I was thinking it, it was the value of the thing made me aware of its presence, That's what a vine branch relationship looks like, right? It's just, it's an awareness of the presence of God. Like his value deposited in you requires notice. Everywhere you go, everything you do, it's, yes, he's with me. Yes, he's added value. I'm more valuable just because he's with me. Man, I want to just look at, look at that. 
That's vine branch relationship. It wasn't, I open the box and it's like, clean it, put it in a safe, take it to the jeweler. There was no list of the, it was just, it was with me and it added value to me. And that's the beauty. And so when I think about this vine branch relationship, it's so powerful. Now look at verse one. It says, I am the true grapevine and my father is the gardener. So when we listen to this language, Jesus is the true grapevine. And and there's very specific language used here, right? Because it's a specific type of fruit that we're talking about. It's not just any fruit. It's a specific type of fruit. It's a very symbolic fruit in Jewish culture too, right? The grape produced the wine. The wine was central. What was Jesus' first miracle? He turned the water into wine, right? When he he offers communion, he gives the wine and says, this is a symbol of my blood shed, right? So there's all of this metaphor. And the idea of this grapevine is it's a representative of blood and the blood of Jesus that would flow out into our veins. So he's the grapevine, the true grapevine. And the implication is you're not the true grapevine. To which we all say, amen. I know. This is one of the things that we usually don't have a hard time with, right? We don't have a hard time recognizing that we are not Jesus and we don't measure up, right? But what we miss is how we're supposed to reflect that true grapevine. Because who's the gardener? The father is the gardener. He's the one that is tending This vineyard, he's the one that's tending the grapevines. And he's saying, I'm merging you in. And listen to this, it says, he cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, to which we all say, ow. That doesn't sound very nice. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit. That sounds like a lose-lose proposition. Don't both of those things mean cut off? He cuts off the vine that doesn't produce fruit, and then he cuts off pieces of the vine that are producing fruit. Any of you have ever had a garden? Anybody ever have a garden? All right. My first year growing a garden, I didn't prune anything. I was like, look at all, look how huge that is. Right? I remember my first year with the tomatoes especially. I just let that thing explode. It was like a 400-foot sequoia tomato plant. Right? And it was supposed to be these like beefsteak tomatoes. Have you guys ever gotten a beefsteak tomato at, at the grocer? Right? They're the big ones. They're great for slicing and putting on a burger or something. They're like massive. And I went out there. They looked like cherry tomatoes. They looked like cherry tomatoes because there was so much energy going to all of this vine stuff that's all over the place. And if I had just pruned it as it was growing, like I do now, I would have had massive fruit that everybody would have looked at and said, wow, that's useful. The problem was the little teeny tomatoes, they would rot and fall off before we could even eat them. And we got one or two, and they weren't even good. See, the the true vine produces fruit, and the gardener is trying to generate a very specific kind of fruit. And he will do what is necessary to make sure that that fruit is healthy and flourishes and grows, right? Right? And so as we look at this, we see how this works. Now, there's another interesting little piece of this with with the way that this is kind of constructed in the Greek because the word that is used there to prune also can mean to lift up. Have you ever seen a, a tree or something that is so heavy with fruit that the branch starts to break? So there's this idea that there are times 
when the, the branch will be propped up so that it doesn't break under the weight of the fruit that's being produced. That's kind of a cool thing too, right? So sometimes God will prune things off and sometimes God will lift things up depending on what he sees as necessary. So what kind of fruit does God want to produce? Well, we find out in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. Right? It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is... Now, before we start quoting all of the fruit, what does it say? But the fruit, not fruits, the fruit... Very important. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Now, pump the brakes for just a second. Many scholars have said, and I would agree, that the fruit of the Spirit is love. And the rest of that description is actually modifying love. Right? So, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, right? Self-control. Those things are pretty good descriptions of love, aren't they? What does Jesus say to us? What's the greatest command according to Jesus? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Or as, again, the way it's constructed, that second love is not actually included in there, so it really should read, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Okay? The, the second love was added for clarity, but I believe Jesus intended it to be one command. I don't think it's two separate commands. I think it's a command. It's love the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself, and it's kind of all wrapped up in one giant burrito, right? That's the way that love looks. And so I believe that the fruit that Jesus is trying to produce in us is love. And I think that's how you stay connected to the vine is love. And so the question I want to ask you today is what do you need to do in your life to kindle your affection for Jesus? There is nothing more important than you, that you can do than to kindle your affection for Jesus. Nothing. Matter of fact, I'm going to skip a whole bunch of my sermon here because I'm running out of time. And I want to just get to something. And as, as we're getting there, though, I think about how many Christians feel the pressure to imitate Jesus. And I'll just kind of re, I'll resurrect that idea for just a second. How many Christians feel the pressure to resurrect or Im, imitate Jesus? Some people feel the need to resurrect Jesus, but he's resurrected already, so don't worry about that. But people feel the need to imitate Jesus. And I think about, like, I have one son, and he and I spend a good amount of time together. And it's funny because, like, when we go back and visit my family, they'll say, golly, he reminds me so much of you, right? Daniel is not trying to imitate me. Daniel spends time with me. And because Daniel and I spend time together, he tends to behave like I behave. He's got the same goofy sense of humor, right? He's, he's so far down the road on dad jokes. Like by the time he becomes a dad, he's gonna be like, I'm gonna move on to grandpa jokes because I am so good at dad jokes already. Like, I don't even need that. I'm going to just bypass it, right? He, he has some features that look like me. When, and it's, it's most often when people who haven't seen me a lot since I was a teenager see him 
Because now you look at me and you're like, well, you no, you don't, you don't look like a 14-year-old boy, Pastor. <laughs> um, we'll just leave it there. <laughs> But, you know, it's, but when people who remember me when I was 14, when they see Daniel, they're like, oh, man, I feel like I'm talking to you when you were a kid. It's so weird. That's what it means to remain in the vine. You're spending time with Jesus, and who you are is shaped by his presence. Man, I hope that that sets in your spirit. I hope you walk away with this. Who you are is shaped by what you're connected to. It doesn't matter if you're connected to Jesus or not. Whatever you're connected to will shape you. There are certain things that I refuse to watch on television now because 10 years ago, I didn't think it bothered me. But now I realize that it does because I'm constantly checking my spirit. And so there are things that I used to watch that I won't watch because now I realize that everything in that thing that I was watching not only did it not glorify God, but it was really offensive to God and stood against what honors God. And so if I'm trying to stay connected to the vine, I, I don't want to fill myself up. I don't want to connect to that because that stuff starts to impart into my spirit. It starts to pass into me, right? It's not a religious checklist. It's not a list of do and don'ts. Please don't hear me saying you can't watch this and you can't watch that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying abide in the vine and work that out in your life as you grow in your relationship with him. But if you find yourself listening to music that is offensive, maybe adjust your playlist. Now I listen almost exclusively to worship music. Not because... I think it's the only thing you can listen to. It just nourishes my spirit and keeps me connected to the vine. So I'm just kind of in this place in my life where I'm like, well, why would I want to listen to anything else? I want to be connected to the vine. I want to stay connected to Jesus. Does that mean that I watch TBN all day? No, I don't. And that would probably cause me to be disconnected from the vine in some ways because I, I get frustrated sometimes. But here's what I have to do. I don't read my Bible because it's a checklist that I have to hit before I start my day. I read it. I, I get up early. I like to get up early. I like to get up before the rest of my family does because it's, it's so quiet. And in the stillness, I hear God. And I like that. And I don't want to trade that. And if I go to bed late, guess what? I'll lose sleep and I'll be okay. I'll lose some sleep to wake up with Jesus. It's fine. Maybe you're not a morning person. For heaven's sake, don't give God the worst part of your day. Like if you wake up and you hate humanity, don't, don't lean in to Jesus during that window. Maybe you're like, Man, Pastor, I'm a one o'clock in the afternoon person. That's my, all right, on your lunch break, get with Jesus. Tell your friends, I'll catch up with you later. Tell your coworkers, hey, we'll have lunch another time. I've got another appointment. Nurture that vine branch relationship. Stay connected. I'm gonna just read a little bit here. It says, Verse 9, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. Do you hear that language? What's he start with? He says, if you remain in me and I remain in you. And then he says what? Remain in my love. Do you hear that? Listen to the language. It's still remain language. 
And he is giving you kind of the point. What's the point? Love, 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 love me. Just remain, like, remain in love with me. If, if Mary and my relationship was defined by I gave her a checklist of things that I wanted her to do for me, and she gave me a checklist of things she wanted me to do for her, we would not have a strong relationship, would we? We would have resentment and frustration and disappointment and shame and distance. But if I live my life and say, man, God, you gave me this woman and I am so thankful. I love her. How can I best serve her today? How can I best help her accomplish your purposes in her life today? How can I best model out who you are so that she will fall more in love with you? How can I live that out today? What happens to our relationship then? If you never cared about what your spouse did for you, your relationship would exponentially improve, exponentially. And generally what I've found is that when I'm living my life to serve my wife, she's interesting in reciprocating the same. She wants to do for me. She wants to love on me. She encourages me. The other morning she woke up, she goes, I am so thankful that God gave me you. I was like, girl... Because I, like, seriously, anybody that knows us knows that I got the better end of the deal, right? And I'm like, wow, thank you, Jesus. And now, verse 10, it says, when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Don't hear this. You, so many times, what we'll do, we'll read a passage of scripture like that, and we'll say, see, it's all about obedience. It's all about doing. No, 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 no. Love comes first. He says in the previous verse, remain in my love. Then he says, if you obey my commandments, you're remaining in my love. So what's the point of that? The point is that the outflow of love is just obedience. It's, it's like, of course. Of course I, of course I want to help. Of course I want to serve. Of course I'm going to talk about you wherever I go because I love you. I'm crazy. Like you can't talk to me for 10 minutes without me telling you about my family, without me telling, let me tell you about my kids. <laughs> Abby was so cute because she can't, right? Like that's how I work. Why? Because I love them. And with Christians, evangelism sometimes is like something that you gotta force yourself to do. No, it's the outflow of a love relationship with Jesus. Like if you're talking to me, I can't help myself. I'm going to talk about Jesus because I love him. I'm not evangelizing. I just want to tell you about the one that loves me and I love and has so radically transformed my life. How can I not tell you about him? Do you see the difference of that? Do you see the difference between obedience and love? Evangelism can be a duty. Evangelism can be an expression of love. You see how this works? Like, when we, when we look at, at the Bible as a book to be studied as if it's like a textbook, it's not. And I look, I get it. I'm, I'm, I totally geek out reading the Bible, right? And I start pulling on threads and dive into the theology and all that stuff. But if your theological and, and kind of biblical studies, if it's not drawing you into a deeper love relationship with Jesus, you're only better equipped to argue. It is nothing. It has to grow your love. That's the point of it. That's why God gave this to us. It's not even an instruction book, but really it's a love letter. And so as we read just a little bit more, I've told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. Do you hear this? Another fruit language. What is it? 
love, joy. You hear that? Your joy will overflow. Why? Because you're in love. You're in love. This is my commandment. Love each other. Now take what you got with me and spread it out. Put down roots, grow the vine, spread it out, share the love. In the same way I have loved you, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Right? In 24 hours, Jesus is actually going to do this. And you are my friends if you do what I command. Again, this is not language, hey, obey, 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 obey. It's everybody's going to be able to tell that you love me because you're just going to be doing all the things that I do. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Wow. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me. I chose you. Don't you love that language? I've always thought about how people say, I found Jesus. And when I read that verse, no, you didn't. He found you. Matter of fact, you probably weren't even looking for Jesus when he found you. Right? You were going, for a bar, you were going to a bar looking for something entirely different when Jesus found you. And he saved you, and he loved you, and he grabbed you, and he snatched you out of your nonsense, and he said, I love you. I love it. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command. Love each other. Man, there is so much here. I love this passage. I love it. We could probably do an entire series just on John 15. There's so much, so much there. And I just, the reason why this is my life verse, life chapter, is because I think it sums it up. And once I discovered that it's not about my performance, but it's about his presence, it changed everything for me. And that's my heart for you. Like, if there's anything that I want as your pastor, is I want you to get this. If you're watching online, the reason that I want you here and not there is because I, you get it when you're here. You, you feel the presence of God in a different way. You interact with other believers in, this, in this, such a unique, special way. You can't get in your living room what you can get in the presence of other believers and the presence of God. And so as we're together, as we're knitting our hearts together, as we're loving each other, you can't love somebody well in isolation. That's what the body of Christ is for. So if you're going to bear fruit, you can't bear fruit in your living room. You've got to bear fruit in relationship. And I realize that there are some who can't come, and I get it. And this is not a condemning thing. This, hear my heart on this. I could care less about attendance numbers. I really could. I would rather have a few people whose lives are being changed than have a church full of people checking boxes, doing the religious thing. That's always been my heart. And so I want to bring you along on this journey with me, with Jesus. I want you to fall in love with him like I've fallen in love with him. I want, I want you to get emotional when you talk about him. I want you, when you see sin, instead of there being a draw to you, I want it to break your heart like it breaks Jesus' heart. Like that's how you know you're, you're moving, you're drifting in his direction and, and his life is flowing in you because the things that used to appeal to you now make you want to throw up. And you say, man, I just want Jesus. I just want Jesus. I think one of the biggest 
challenges that the American Christian faces is that we have most everything that we need. And it's sad. Because the majority of American Christians, it's just about checking the boxes. But here's, here's the reality. I don't think that most Christians lose their faith. I think most Christians lose their need for faith. I don't need faith. I got it. I got it taken care of. I'm good. Right? But you need him. You need him. I want to pray for you. Um, I realize that, that we're a little later here, and so I'm not going to have like an official altar time, but I just want to close because I don't want you to miss this moment. I want you to really fairly assess your life. Take your spiritual temperature right now. Just everybody quiet. Just close your head. Close, close your head. Close your head. Close your eyes. Like some of you need to close your head because closing your eyes isn't enough, right? I want you to close your eyes. I want you to settle your heart. Just kind of try to be really focused and contemplative right now. And ask yourself the question, where am I with Jesus? Do I care? Have I grown cold? Am I just doing the church thing? Am I just doing the Christian thing? Or do I really, really want him? God, I pray that in this quiet moment, you would speak to hearts. I don't want people to come and just hear a sermon. I want people to come and look in a mirror of your word and find the inconsistencies and the imperfections in their life. Submit them to you so that you can do a work. Lord Jesus, I pray for every person in this room that we will have moved closer to you. God, that we would have fairly and honestly evaluated our lives and that we would say, yes, Lord, I want more of you. God, please forgive me. Forgive me for my apathy. Help me, Lord, because there is a dying world that needs me to bear fruit. Please, Lord, help us to be a fruit-bearing people, not because we're trying harder, but because we're living closer. We're loving you more. God, I ask that you would seal this time. Seal what you're doing in our hearts. Let us turn our eyes toward heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for being here.